Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. So that's a little note to myself to begin recording the video, which I did. Now, um, you can go ahead and lower your hand. Okay. Now, the first thing, the very, very first thing you want to do before we um, begin this course is for you to go ahead and uh, um, go to Canvas. Okay. On Canvas, what I want you to do is to enable notifications. Okay, so what I want you to do is under your notification preferences, you can reach that by clicking on your profile um, and then selecting the notification option. What I want you to do um, that is helpful for this course and also for other courses is um, there are different priority levels that you can set. Okay, when I, uh, I have chosen um, the priorities that I want to assign to different activities, okay? For example, this is the important thing I want you to pay attention to. Any announcement I make, okay? You want to um, subscribe to that. Uh, you want to make sure it is in the green checkbox because that is uh, notified right away, okay? Anything with a clock is a daily reminder anything with a calendar view, uh, um, that events, you get um, notified on a weekly basis, so on and so forth. So there are four priority levels, all the way from um, notif being notified immediately to not being notified at all on the right, okay? So, but what I want you to do is for this particular activity, which is an announcement, I want you to uh, I want you to make sure that it is enabled to be um, notified right away using this green check mark here, okay? So that way, whenever I make an announcement, and there are going to be multiple announcements, uh, and I assure you I'm not going to spam your uh, um, inbox. I just want to have a sure shot way to reach you um, when I need to broadcast some important message. So the first thing is to update your notification preferences. If you miss something, okay, about upcoming homeworks, about upcoming um, exams, assignments, um, and any extra credit opportunities, all of that will be via Canvas, okay? All of that will be via Canvas. So you want to make sure that you're um, signed up to Canvas. And that's about all the use we get out of Canvas as a medium to communicate any important messages, okay? But the course content itself, okay? Let me go um, to Moodle, okay? The course content itself is all hosted on um, Moodle. Okay, again, by a show of hands, how many of you have been able to access this course and uh, at least um, look through the material or if not, um, just be able to access this material here? Okay, pretty good, pretty good. Good, good, good. Sure, so you can go ahead and lower your hand. It's, if you do not, it does not matter if you're registered to the course, you paid the fees, you have been dropped out, it does not matter um, as long as you have an ECS account. Okay, as long as you have an ECS account, you should be able to access the course. I don't care if you pay the fees or not, or I don't care if you're officially enrolled in the course or not. I want to make sure that you have access to the course material. That way you're not, um, you, you can access the videos and all the um, exams, quizzes, so on and so forth. And for that, you have to use the access key that's on the syllabus, okay? The syllabus is posted on Canvas and it's also posted on uh, Moodle. So there are a bunch of different places to access that. 
Okay, so let me quickly show you around on Moodle. Okay, there is going there is this announcements tab. As I mentioned already, I'm not going to be using this tab um, for um, making any announcements. I'll be using Canvas. Okay, and then there is the syllabus and the homework and exam schedule. I'll quickly go over that. But what you want to see is on this one page. Okay, on this one page, the entire semester is laid out for you. Each chapter has a set of chapter objectives. Okay, it's a set of chapter objectives. Then there is the lecture PDF notes itself. And corresponding to that, there are some videos. And by the way, uh, all the material here, including the exams, including the quizzes, is developed by Professor Rastetro. Okay, so he made some videos and he was he has been kind enough to make them available to me. Okay, and available to us for our benefit. Now, the same with chapter two as well. Okay, chapter two, each chapter has a set of objectives, lecture notes, and videos. Okay, uh, in addition to that, and I'll talk about the um, individual weightage of all of these uh, assignment components in a minute but then you want to understand that there are homeworks all of these homeworks are online as you can imagine um, and then there is exams okay this exams in addition to that there is some practice quizzes all the way at the bottom of the page which are not counted towards final grade and i'll talk more about this shortly so practice quizzes are to help you practice for the exams and then there are these homeworks okay it's a very uh, busy course uh, in the sense that there's going to be something um, opening up some exam some homework opening up um, almost every two days Okay, so that's the idea. Um, you can access the lecture notes, you can access the videos, and you can uh, access the quizzes. Okay. So let me quickly talk about the breakdown of the grades. So again, thank you, first of all, and uh, welcome to Engineering 17 course again. And uh, this has been developed. Um, by Professor Russ Tetro. Okay, and I thank him for sharing the material. So here is the textbook. Oops, here is the textbook I use. Um, electric circuits. And it's a recommended. I don't go around imposing and checking if you do have the textbook or not. But it, I strongly recommend um, if you can get your hands on it, if you can, um, if you think it's going to be worth your investment sure go ahead and um, get the textbook okay but i will be talking um, about examples from the textbook um, your quizzes will be from problems at the end of the chapters so on and so forth so i will be referring to the textbook when i'm um, creating the quizzes and the exams and homeworks but you can get enough practice by looking at the homeworks themselves so um, it's a choice up to you so the exam, uh, the um, the course has three exams. Two of those are midterms and one final exam. The final exam is not cumulative, and I'll give you the times for this. So the three exams are worth forty-five percent, and the homework itself is worth fifty-five percent. Okay. Then there is the practice quizzes. You can take these practice quizzes um, just for as practice for your midterm. They are not worth um, any points on your final grade. Okay. The idea, the fundamental goals of the course are to introduce you to um, a set of tools, a suite of tools when it comes to circuit analysis. When you have a circuit and you're trying to understand how it behaves. Well, you have to have a set of tools, um, analysis tools to help you understand linear circuits. Okay, so you encounter a lot of um, 
you encounter a lot of resistors, capacitors, inductors, voltage and current sources. And of course, operational amplifiers um, in electric circuits. And we give, and there, there are a lot uh, more um, different components than just these. But here is a foot in the door kind of introduction, introductory codes. So we'll talk about resistors, capacitors, inductors, voltage current sources, operational amplifiers. And importantly, how they behave when they're connected together. Okay, so this is more a preparatory foot in the door introduction to um, advanced electronic applications in circuit analysis. Okay, um, all the material is available online, so you can continue um, consuming that at your own pace. Okay, and then um, and I also incorporated a bit of freedom, leeway into the uh, deadlines. That way, um, during the busy um, summer semester, you have um, you can to some extent set your own pace. Okay, all the course material are available on Moodle. That's the important thing. You want to make sure that you have access to Moodle and that you're able to take the homework. So you do want to test homework one as soon as possible, just to make sure that everything is smooth, you have access. And then um, uh, that, that kind of preview of what to expect for, uh, throughout the semester. Certain things um, that we tell a bit about what you will be learning in the course. Okay, so here is some more information about homeworks. Okay, here is some more information about homeworks. Um, you can submit the homework any number of times. So homework actually, if you remember, it is worth 55% of the final grade. All right, and then here is your chance to take the homework exam as many homework as many times as you want and get a perfect 100%. There is no reason, there is no reason to not attempt to get them to get um, less than 100%. So you really want to um, take make use of this opportunity for free 55 points of the final grade. Okay, so that's about the homework more um, meant to stimulate um, your uh, practice, okay? In addition to that, there will be um, three exams. Two of them will be midterms. Each of those are 60 uh, minute exams. And there will be one two hour final exam. And I'll give you the dates for these, okay? So these are the exams and the exams are once and done. So you can only take these exams one time. Okay, there's no second um, chance on that. Now, fortunately, um, before you actually take the exams, you can um, take the quizzes that kind of simulate the experience of taking the exam because they're timed. Okay, so some of these are timed, some of these are not timed. So pay attention to all of those. So they taking the practice quizzes. So practice quizzes are also um, one hour. Okay, and they're also once and done. Okay, however, um, they're not graded, so you should be um, able to, uh, without being deterred, you should be able to take the quiz as a practice for the exam. Okay, that's at least the philosophy uh, behind making the quizzes uh, timed. Okay. Now, it's very highly unlikely that uh, you should need to take the exam um, at a different time because most of the exams are scheduled during the class time. Okay, so here is the grading policy, um, the letter grade policy, and then the class average is usually in the C plus range. Okay, class average is usually in the C plus range. Now, let me quickly talk about the um, exam and homework schedule, 
Okay, let me talk about the exam and homework schedule before I come back to talk about how it is relevant to your um, major. Okay, now um, these are the topics we're going to cover. Um, here is a day by day, week by week breakdown of the list of the topics that we will be covering. And I want you to pay attention to the fact that this is This is tentative, it's subject to change, okay? Depending on the needs of the class, okay? So um, the exams, homework, so here is a color-coded sheet of the schedule of all the exams and the homeworks, okay? For example, shown in yellow highlight here, there are three exams, midterm exam one, which is on the 8th of June, midterm exam two, which is on the 23rd of June, and then the final exam itself is on the 2nd of July. So um, you know how long each of these exams um, is for one hour, one hour, and the topics that are covered, chapters one, two, three, chapters four, five, six, chapters nine, 10, so on and so forth. So most of the assignments and the deadlines are scheduled around these exams. For example, um, your exam one is on six, eight, okay? So a lot of your homeworks that are actually color coded in green highlight here, they are due on the seventh, okay? So in addition to that, um, there is an exam on the 23rd, okay? So a lot of your homeworks are due on the 22nd, okay? So um, I try to schedule the exams in such a manner that uh, the homeworks in such a manner that um, you have time to take them before the relevant exam, okay? So any homeworks related to chapter nine and 10, are going to be due on 7-1 on the 1st of July because the final exam itself, which um, uh, tests you on chapter nine and 10, well, that's, uh, that's uh, um, on the 2nd of July. So you see what I'm saying here, okay? So there is a um, method to how I have scheduled the um, homework assignments around the, um, close date or the exam dates, okay? So that's something you want to pay attention to. And these homeworks actually um, closed on the 11.59 p.m. of that particular day, okay? So these are all um, color coded for you to um, easily understand the close date. And you can take each of these exams as many homeworks. You can take each of these homeworks as many times as you want, okay? There's a homework that's becoming available today, okay? There's another homework too that is becoming available on 28. Homework three, available on um, six, um, June 1st, okay? And all of these are due on the 7th of June, okay? So that's, that's kind of the idea. Okay, and then you can use them for practice as many times as you want. Okay, if you did not already sign, I want you to sign up using the using the um, access code over here. Okay, questions please, questions so far. And there is some general information about um, when you're plugging in your answers into the online testing engine on Moodle. Okay, it's graded automatically. What is an acceptable answer? Um, what is not acceptable answer? What is the expected answer? So on and so forth. So you can pay attention to that if you're consistently having problems um, with the units, so on and so forth. Okay. Questions, please. Questions so far.
All right. One of the things I do want to encourage in this class is for you to be able to answer um, and ask questions um, at any time, at any point in time. It's completely acceptable with me. It's completely fine with me if you want to unmute yourself and just ask any question that you have. Okay. Now, by a show of hands, or let's let's not do the show of hands. Let's do the chat. Oh, there's a question in the chat. So um, let's see. Now, what you want to do is, um, I want one volunteer, okay, to keep an eye on the chat and let me know any time um, there is some question coming in the chat, even while I'm talking about the um, material. When somebody chats in the um, group chat window, there's a question. Is there any volunteer who can help me with that? Okay, Tyler, perfect. Thank you. So Tyler is going to keep an eye on the chat window. And if there are questions in the chat, coming in the chat window, he's going to alert me. Now, um, if you have different versions of the textbook, and I assume that you paid for um, any online version that you receive. And that is, um, I don't encourage that you um, hold on to um, uh, illegitimate versions of um, the textbook. But if you do have a legitimate version, a PDF version of the book or anything, it's a, it's a good idea to use it. I, I strongly encourage you to use it. I don't require that you actually um, go and pay for a hard copy. Okay. Um, now, there's another question about um, ECS password. Uh, I'm not sure. I I would assume, um, and it's a say it would be a safe assumption that you should be able to change the um, password. Okay. But um, when you're sharing the textbooks around, I want to make sure that um, it's a legitimate copy and I don't want to um, uh, endorse any illegitimate copy. And the rest is um, um, between you, um, between you students. So I only strongly encourage you that um, you should use a legitimate version of the book. Uh, of course, now um, other questions, please. So let's see, um, why don't you type in the chat window, the different, um, the different major you're in, if you're in CPE, if you're in mechanical engineering, if you're in electrical engineering. So each of you will type your uh, major. Let's see where you're from. Mechanical engineering, quickly. Okay. Cool. Okay. Good, good, good. So this is, um, I, I see some of you are from uh, CP, some of you are from mechanical engineering, some of you are from electrical engineering. Those of you who are in the electrical engineering, this will be um, the most fundamental um, uh, course that you, that's going to, that's going to uh, lay the foundation for anything in electrical engineering, okay? The basic bread and butter um, analysis tools. Um, so that is how it is relevant to you. Even in CPE, um, as, as an engineer in your in your very long career as an engineer, you are expected to analyze, design, understand different electrical circuits. And in this course, we provide the tools. Um, we provide you with the tools necessary to understand the behavior of different elements, different circuit elements when they're placed into circuits. Mechanical engineers, okay? Mechanical engineers, um, one motivation is that um, your fundamentals of engineering, professional engineering exam, all of these include questions. So if you're going for um, certification exams, this is going to be important. But 
Equally importantly, even though you're mechanical engineering, there's a lot of similarities between how mechanical um, components perform and electronic components perform, okay? So there's a lot of parallels between um, energy stored in a capacitance inductance to energy stored in a spring, kinetic energy stored in a spring, a parallel between the electrical world and the mechanical world. So if you develop the understanding in one um, world, one um, paradigm, electrical engineering, that's going to be transferable, okay, to um, analyzing and understanding a lot of mechanical systems. Example is half CV squared is the energy stored in a capacitance. Okay, half MV squared is the kinetic energy of a body um, moving at some particular velocity m and has a mass m and velocity v. Similarly, the voltage and capacitance they lead to energy stored in a cap kinetic energy. So this kind of half kx squared energy stored in a spring, it's easy to see that there are parallels in terms of the energy and many other um, components, many other parameters. Um, when it comes to the electrical um, and the electrical paradigm and the um, mechanical paradigm. So that's just one example for us to understand the relation between these two different worlds. Okay, additionally, um, the power that is necessary to move the mechanical components, that is provided by the electrical system, electrical motors, okay? So we need to understand that quite a bit. So it's a fundamental for mechanical engineering. Similarly, for um, computer engineering and electrical engineering students, Okay, um, when you take 117, okay, 108, 109, they expect, all of these courses expect that you have a thorough understanding of the material um, coming from engineering one, um, engineering 17, okay? So we talk about the basic building blocks, resistance, capacitance, inductance, Okay, uh, and how they behave when you place them in circuits. So that's kind of the motivation. Okay, that's kind of the motivation for why you want to pay attention and how the topics that we cover in this course are relevant to you. Okay, now um, here is the instructional strategy. We look at DC sources first. Okay. Um, analyze only DC, purely DC voltage sources. This is the simplest possible circumstance. That'll be in chapters one to six. Then, um, until then we'll only be talking mostly about resistors, okay? Beginning in chapter six, we'll actually be talking about um, capacitors and inductors, okay? Um, which have some um, relation um, time varying relationship, so time varying sources, sinusoid mostly, as an example, and a representative of a, a lot of time varying sources. Then uh, we bring it all together to analyze circuits when the source may be DC or it may be time varying or both. Okay, a combination of AC and DC analysis. In chapter 10, um, we look at some of the Fundamentals theorems, okay, power transfer theorem, utilities um, that, that is necessary in, in designing um, good utility um, electric systems. Okay, and questions, please. Questions so far? So, in terms of the course, de course demands, as you know, summer is going to be a pretty um, rigorous schedule, a busy schedule. So you want to make sure that you devote a um, significant amount of time. So 10, week, 10 hours a week during a regular 15 week semester, but it's going to be a bit more busy during the summer. So you may end up needing more time. 
Okay. So, um, and I know that this is going to be a required, this is a required course, Engineering 17 is a required course um, in your uh, major. Um, so, thank you for taking this course and I hope you have a very good experience. Um, you'll enjoy it as much as I enjoy teaching it. Okay. Questions, please. Other questions? Questions so far? Okay, sometimes don't be deterred. What I will be doing is I will call on you using your name, okay? <clears throat> For example, um, I'm going to say, Jose, Jose Rodriguez, you can go ahead and lower your hat, okay? And if there are some questions, if you don't have questions in the class, I will from time to time to keep the class um, more discussion oriented, um, oriented approach i'm going to keep the um, i'm going to call on you so there's nothing don't be deterred there is no wrong answer i'm not doing i'm not asking i'm i'm not calling on you to embarrass you or make you feel uncomfortable it's just to keep the class in discussion there is nothing um, um, like a wrong answer okay i want to encourage an environment of discussion um, questions if you have questions um, nothing um, brings me to life more than a student question. Um, talking at you makes me feel really, really uncomfortable. So I strongly encourage you and urge you to take part in the discussion and ask any questions that you may have. And more importantly, don't be deterred to ask any question. Okay? Now, we're going to begin with chapter one. And this is really neatly, nicely organized by chapters and chapter sections by Professor Rustetro. A special thanks to him. Okay, now let's see. Um, before we move on to this chapter, let's um, spend a couple of minutes, maybe one or two minutes, um, on uh, getting your feedback from how the previous spring semester went when you transition to online okay any volunteers to unmute and let us know um, how you felt and uh, and what could be done differently uh, what could have been done differently um, beginning this summer uh well the one thing that i was kind of disappointed about when we went to online was the difficulty in getting tutoring sessions set up. That's kind of something I was using a lot was I was going to the AIRC and meeting up with tutors to, you know, get help in my classes. And then without that face-to-face -face interaction, um, I felt like my understanding of some topics kind of suffered a little bit. So I would like to see um, a lot more online tutoring capabilities from the school. Yeah. Sure, I think that's a that's a very good point. As a matter of fact, I tell you what, um, the university has received a part of um, emergency money, and then they're using our college is getting a chunk out of it. There's there's some money flowing in the right direction, and that's being put to good use in terms of increasing the summer, or increasing the um, not the summer, but the tutoring. Um, experience and tutoring resources. That's a very good point. Thank you, Titer. Other comments, please. How, be, how many of you felt, you can show me maybe by a show of hands, how many of you felt that online was overall a better experience because you were able to um, view the videos later or for whatever reasons? How many of you felt was, uh, how many of you felt that the online was better? Okay. Some of you um, are not happy with online. Some of you are happy with um, Jonathan. Um, do I understand you right that uh, you felt the face-to-face -face as a better experience? Uh, yeah, I just find it more uh, like interactive or engaging. It's easier yeah. for me to take notes and yeah. Yeah. Face-to-face -face yeah. is better for me. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That's true. But fortunately for me, it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because um, 
like I'm doing I, for quite some time. I have been kind of um, did not want to um, venture into teaching online out of various inhibitions. Um, but uh, because um, it became necessary and essential, I started recording my videos and posting them on YouTube. And uh, as the student uh, reviews came back in, the insights I had was that um, students being able to go back and review the videos, that helped them a bit. And so um, they, I have positive feedback. So for me, I have been, I have been, uh, fortunate that I was able to turn it into a blessing in disguise. But I, I do understand there are many, uh, many uh, complications that arise from here. Okay, but what I plan to do, though, is, um, again, make these videos available on YouTube. So don't forget, okay, R Professor Russ Tetro himself made videos, short, um, video clips, maybe 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 15 minutes, as short as necessary, and as short as possible, okay? So he made really structured videos. In addition to that, um, I hope to, and I plan to make um, videos of our class available on YouTube. That way, you can see me work on some of these problems. You can see me annotate on the PowerPoints and then um, view the video over and over again. And in addition to that, um, when I get a chance to work on that, maybe sometime later this week, I hope to be able to upload all of these annotations to Google Drive, okay? So you don't have to be in a copying frenzy. You don't have to take notes um, in a frantic manner. It's, it's all going to be available. So you don't have to take notes unless you want. Okay, so let's get started with chapter one. Um, a very easy chapter, a very um, fitting beginning. It's, it's a uh, kind of uh, chapter that you want to, um, that kind boosts your confidence and makes you feel good um, for the upcoming chapters. Okay, um, most of these you already know. It should be a review for you. Okay, section 1.1. Okay, so what is this course about? Um, this course, and more importantly, this section is about circuit theory, okay? In an introductory level, okay? It's an introductory level, okay? And we make certain assumptions. We make certain special linear case assumptions. So the idea is we don't go into the electromagnetic field theory that you have learned in other courses, okay? We make very simple, um, assumptions about how the circuit is going to behave um, and impose certain limitations in order to make the analysis easy on us, okay? So we are not going to go into um, complicated um, EM equations, rather we are going to make simplified linear um, assumptions and make analysis based on that to give us insights, okay? So we are going to insight without getting lost in details. Okay, if you really go into the EMAC equations, okay, EM equations, and then um, try to analyze them, well, they're very, very accurate and they're very, um, uni they're universal, but what happens is the details in there can be bewildering. Uh, you could get lost in a con maze of um, numbers and equations. But in circuit theory, what we are more interested in is um, big picture insights into the overall behavior of the circuits. Okay, we make some lump circuit assumptions. You have already been introduced to EMAC in your physics courses. We kind of um, move into simple, simple um, simplifications based on that. Okay, there are some um, there are some assumptions that we make. We assume um, linear lumped parameter time invariant um, behavior. Okay, the meaning linear meaning is that y equals to 
mx, y plus k, or, or x plus k, m times x plus k is um, going to be an equivalent y prime. Okay, so in other words, the idea is there is an input, there's an output. Okay, if an input is increased by a particular amount, okay, then the output is going to be increased by y um, mx plus m times k. So the idea is that there is a linear relationship when uh, uh, the input is increasing, the output increases linearly um, as a function of uh, the input. Okay, so we don't look at non-linear quadratic or other relationships in this course. Okay, there are, um, transistors that are beyond this course is one example of non-linear relationship. Okay, so there are some assumptions that we make. Okay, we assume, and these are all simplifications. The linear model is a simplification of um, the Emac. Um, equations okay so there are some assumptions we make we assume that electrical effects happen instantaneously throughout the system okay it's a lump parameter which also implies that our system is linear okay the idea the fundamental um, assumption is that electrical effects the resistance the inductance the capacitance um instantaneously happen throughout this system okay net change on every component in the system is zero. Here is another fundamental assumption, okay? That goes back to the idea of conservation of energy. Energy cannot be consumed. Um, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be converted from one form to another. Even so, charge, the net charge on every component, it's okay to have separation of charges, okay? If there is a net positive charge somewhere, there must be an equivalent net negative charge somewhere else. But the overall system, okay, conserves charge. You cannot simply create positive charge out of thin air without, without creating a negative corresponding charge, okay? This kind of goes back to the, this kind of goes to the a loose analogy. And I always like these loose analogies to the idea of matter versus antimatter. Okay, so that goes back. Um, for, every, um, for every atom of matter that we have in the universe, there is, a, there is a, um, uh, it's assumed that there, there must be a, uh, a, an equivalent mass of antimatter. Okay, and the idea is that when you bring the matter and the antimatter together, they annihilate. Okay, so one is the opposite of the other. Similarly, um, that, that's at least that's at least one theory. Now, in physics, the idea is in electrical engineering, the idea is charge cannot be created or destroyed out of thin air. Any positive charge created in one place leaves a negative equivalent charge somewhere else. Okay, and that, that, that's an assumption then, and that's true as well. The third assumption that we make is that there is no magnetic coupling between components in a circuit. Okay, that's an assumption that we make. Magnetic coupling inside a circuit element is okay, but not between two circuit elements, unless otherwise specified um, explicitly. Okay. So, <clears throat> So these are very, very um, simplistic assumptions. The real world, okay, uh, may not adhere to our assumptions. But for this course, we are going to make our analysis simple by assuming that there is a, a linear relationship between input and output. And then there is a lumped circuit behavior. And then conservation of charge, which is of course universal. And the third assumption is that there is no magnetic coupling between different circuit elements, okay? So that's something um, we use to simplify our life here. So here 
is a typical design flow in electrical engineering. And some of these aspects are applicable to any other design. So as engineers, let's say um, Francis um, gets an excellent job as a design, electrical design engineer. Okay, what you will do, or, or um, Edgar, or Ramandeep, let's say um, the three of you find a very good um, job as an engineer, as a design engineer. Okay, um, you will find yourself knowingly or unknowingly, if you do it um, knowingly, consciously, that's all the more better. Um, that when you're designing electrical circuits, okay, this is the design flow that you'll um, follow. Okay, you'll almost always start with some kind of societal need. That is what motivates. I want to be able to, I want to be able to pump water. Okay, I want to be, there is a problem and there is an area that doesn't have, um, that's not irrigated, for example. Okay, um, you as an engineer, electrical engineer, um, want to find a design, a, a, a motor that pumps water from a um, low-lying area to a, a some, some, there is some motivation, some societal need that motivates. The need can be very simple like this, or the way need can be a more um, holistic, a um, far-reaching need. But then fundamentally there is a um, societal need um, to make things better, optimize some kind of um, societal need. Then you start with, um, with that need as a motivation. You want to encapsulate the design specifications. So how much power? So he, this is where you quantify. in terms of a contract, okay? So let's say there is a, um, a, um, a let's say there is a uh, company um, that is approached, okay? By a user, uh, by a customer, okay? Um, and then there's a design company. Okay, these design specifications, the customer approaches the company asking for a product. Okay, now um, this design specifications, this document quantifies um, the behavior of the final design product. And then that acts as a contract between the customer and the company. So this is where you quantify what is the power consumed? What is the bill of materials used? Or what is the list of materials used? What is the weight um, of the product? Okay, what is the price of the product? So on and so forth, okay? So how much power does it consume? What is the delay? Um, what is going to be the functionality of the system? So all of these are quantified and encapsulated into the idea of design specifications. So you, as a design engineer, use this as a beginning and ending document to see how well your design is performing. So for example, um, you build a circuit model, okay? And then you test it. When you're testing it, you are always asking the question, does my circuit meet the specifications, okay? So when it does meet the specifications, you know where to stop, okay? So design specs document tells you where to begin in some sense, and also where to stop, okay? So um, this is the idea, I iterative. The fundamental point is that um, there is a version 0.0, there's a version 1.0, you iteratively test and refine um, your design system, okay? That's the idea of a typical design process, okay? If you expect to get um, 
the best perfect design in version 0.0, .0 well then there is a um, risk that uh, perfect will become the enemy of good. So what you'll always end up is successive refinement. Okay, it is always a successive refinement based on some kind of testing. Of course, um, there is um, before you actually release the final product, you have to do a prototype testing. You have to demonstrate to your customer who gave you, who approached you um, for designing the product. Um, you want to demonstrate to your customer that it works in the real world, not just circuit model, but uh, your system works in the real world. So that's a physical prototype. And then um, at each of these levels, there is fundamental a um, bunch of different levels of testing. So uh, the big things that you want to understand from this slide, and, and these are some things that you want to etch in your head, is that as design engineers, you need to have design specs, okay? And then you need to have some kind of model, okay? Model, um, some kind of simulation okay it's not the real thing but it gives a very good estimate a very calculated estimation of how the real world is going to behave okay and then you have the prototype itself prototype of the product that you're trying to design, okay? And then there is the final product, okay? Now, the very, very important thing for us is that between each of these steps, there is multiple levels of iterative testing. If you think about it, Okay, um, my wife works as a software engineer. My brother works um, at Intel. So um, I know, I have seen, and I worked with Cadence design systems. Um, and in all, in all my experience in the industry and from the folks that I know, I have seen that testing is a very, very important part. Almost 50% of the resources of any team are um, dedicated towards testing. And then there is, of course, 50% to designing development, R&D, so on and so forth, okay? So the idea is, in a design team, in a design team, a big chunk of resources are centered around the testing, okay? It's a very important step. and. Um, we can have confidence in our models, in our product, only if we test the heck out of it, only if we test it um, inside out. Only after thoroughly testing the product do we have confidence as engineers. And confidence, by confidence, I just don't mean a qualitative um, a feeling or intuition, rather a quantitative number that says, um, these are the tolerances, this is the, a range in which it's going to operate with 100% accuracy, with 90% accuracy, so on and so forth. So um, testing is an important process through all of this, is I guess the bottom line that I'm trying to drive. Okay, questions please, questions so far. Okay, I have a question for you, I do have a question for you. Now, can you think of an example, a practical example, um, from uh, what's going on in the real world today in terms of how a model can be different from a real world. Can you please restate the question? I didn't catch the end. Yes, yes, sorry about that. Uh, the idea is there is model, modeling behaviors, right? And then there is the real world. Can you think of an example as to how there can be a difference and disparity between a model or a prediction and the real world behavior of a phenomenon.
Um, I guess one difference between a model and the actual use, um, I guess, could just be the fact that the model is going to be based on perfect environment, perfect standards. Um, yes. Whereas in the real world, that's not true. Nothing is perfect. There's always going to be an external source of heat or friction or something yes. that could affect the model that you designed that you may not think about while creating the model, which is the purpose yes. of the refinement and the testing. Absolutely. I think that's a very, very um, cogent way of um, putting it. The idea that uh, our model, and these words are by um, uh, Dr. Anthony Fauci, our model is only as good as our assumptions. Right, so um, there could be quite a bit of disparity between um, the assumptions that we feed into our model to simulate and predict um, what a phenomenon, how a phenomenon is going to behave, and it's going to be significantly. It could be significantly different from the environment, the real world environment in which um, our system operates. And um, another example that's very true, a more striking example. Um, about how there can be uh, a fundamental difference between model and a real world is uh, the predictions about coronavirus. The numbers were all over the place um, to begin with. But um, I guess um, the wisdom in making over uh, pessimistic models was that um, we get some policy decisions um, that are on the side of caution. But the idea is that um, there is a fundamental difference between models and the real world. Um, that's at least in a phenomenon um, like coronavirus that hasn't, that hasn't been understood thoroughly. But in case of electrical, um, uh, electrical circuit design, okay, fortunately, we have been studying the circuits and developing models very, very accurately for quite some time, we refined our understanding um, and then our theory behind um, our understanding. So our models are much, much more close and accurate to the real world behavior of electrical systems than um, the, uh, the, the coronavirus models are. You know, just because it has been a um, really short phenomenon, short-lived phenomenon that hasn't been understood um, thoroughly, okay? But the idea is modeling is in some sense a simulation of uh, uh, the system that we expect, um, the, that we expect to be, okay? In the real world, there's going to be some fundamental difference, okay? So as engineers, we find ourselves um, solving problems, societal problems. It could be uh, a very complicated societal problem, or it could be a very simple, um, small technical problem, okay? Um, and then all of these problems, we use rigorous mathematical tools, design tools. And we design stuff and make society a better place. Okay, and in in that sense, that's what defined it makes us different from an attorney or lawyer. Okay, we design. Okay, and then how are we different from hobbyists? The hobbies do design um, sometimes, but that's more motivated for pleasure. Okay, but for us engineers, we do this for a living. We, we want to make money out of the product, the design tool, okay? So the idea is solve a societal problem using math tools and physics um, underlying fundamental technical tools, okay? Um, and we design and, and um, we what we do is we market this product okay so we want to do this in a financially viable manner we don't want to lose money doing it we want to be smart and shrewd when we um, when we design our products okay so you solve your societal problems both large and small 
usually paid and that's what makes us different from a hobby is we are paid we do, we do this for a living and um, because we do this for a living and because we have to market our products we have to think about the costs um, involved in um, marketing the product as well okay if you solve a lot of problems you should have a method for solving the problem some way to get organized okay well um, that's exactly what we have seen here so the design flow that i have shown here okay this guy is the methodology okay around which we design um, our product okay we solve our problem okay that's the idea okay that's the methodology um, around which we um, we get organized and then uh, the first thing um, to solving any problem is to identify the problem okay what is it uh, that i want to solve what is it that i want to design for okay identify what you know and what we need to know what are the unknown unknowns what are the known knowns known unknowns so on and so forth okay so there are um there's a quadrant of of uh, uh, around which uh, along which our knowledge can be uh, knowledge can be uh, classified okay so known knowns and unknown unknowns so th this is where we have to do um, research and development Okay, when you talk about research and development, that involves um, known unknowns and also unknown unknowns as well. Okay, creating new knowledge. Okay, um, using known knowns sufficiently and efficiently comes down to designing. So you ha we have to visualize the problem, sketch the system out, and employ useful models. Okay, we want to employ useful models. Okay, and we have to brainstorm the range of possible solutions so this is a typical engineering design flow even if you're a software engineer you're a mechanical engineer you're an electrical engineer doesn't matter um, the typical engineering design flow is around this idea of successive refinement okay then we calculate we do some um, we apply some equations if there are equations we use the uh, existing equations well if there are no equations that sufficiently um, captured the behavior of my um, system, then, well, I have wandered into research, then I have to create the equations. I have to develop new knowledge, new understanding, um, add to the state of the art, okay? And then we create equations, but then we use equations. When we say model, we, an equation is a model that gives us an intuition that stimulates the relationship between input and output okay so we calculate and then there's a um an ample room to be creative here there's an absolutely um, um absolutely a lot of a lot of room to be creative who says engineers can be creative um just look at the innovation that has all been driven in the um, tech field Okay, take one company. There are a lot of companies. I'm not, I'm not um, um, endorsing any one company or promoting any one company. But just as, a, as an example, take Apple um, and all the wonderful products that they have um, developed over the year. And then you tell me that engineers cannot be creative. Engineers, there is this false notion among some that creative um, only writers, poets. Um, um, they are the creative people. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of effort to dispel that um, notion or counter that argument. Just look at the wonderful products that have been developed in the tech sector recently. So engineers can be creative. The idea, the room for creativity comes from the fact that there's a lot of, lot of um, design constraints that compete with each other. For example, noise, power and um, speed let's let's get rid of noise because that's a bit more technical the idea is um, in your battery in your phone okay um, you want your battery to consume 
as little power as possible and you want your battery to last as long as possible, but you don't want the performance to suffer. So there is a trade-off and there is a competing design constraints, okay? And these kinds of competing design constraints and a lot of those set up the environment for wonderful creative solutions that kind of find sweet spot, okay? And that's, that's where um, the room for creativity, to exercise your creativity comes in, okay? So engineers get to be creative. And then, of course, um, we test our solutions thoroughly, thoroughly um, across different environmental conditions, across different operating conditions, across different fundamental conditions, so on and so forth. And of course, you rinse and repeat like you would with a shampoo. Okay, you rinse and repeat, so on and so forth. Rinse and repeat meaning you test your solution, you successively refine your assumptions, models, and your um, design. Okay, questions please, questions so far. All right, so that's about the engineering design process. So we as engineers pay attention to numbers. Okay, numbers are holy to us. Okay, that's, um, and in order to quantify, this is, this is about physicists and engineers, right? We pay attention to numbers, just like, um, just like a financial analyst pays attention to the numbers, okay? So um, if you ask me the three fields um, that pay most attention to numbers, okay? Maybe the field of finance, okay? Engineering, and then um, physics, okay? And then uh, we pay attention to numbers in the sense that points matter, units matter, decimals matter, and we want to be able to we want to be, uh, we want to have standard um, units for any quantity that we measure. We want to be able to measure. So more than anything, engineers have a need to measure, have a, have a um, um, cognitive need to measure, quantify. We understand the world in terms of numbers. Okay, so, um, and in order to do that efficiently um, and in a standard manner, we need units. Okay, so the idea is that uh, there, there can be a, um, a silly mistake that could lead to, lead to problems when there is no standard, um, standard uh, set of units. For example, NASA lost its 125 million Mars orbiter, okay, because of a mismatch, because of a really silly mismatch um, in the units, okay. One of them used the JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, used metric systems, and the Lockheed Martin used, um, used the English system. So there was a mismatch, and we, owing to this silly um, misunderstanding, uh, calamity happened. Okay, so the idea is that that should kind of motivate the need for having a standard of measurement, standard for measurements, okay? Um, we define some fundamental quantities, some fundamental quantities. Okay, fundamental quantities and the um, symbols and units, okay? Length is measured in meters, mass in kilogram, time in seconds, so on and so forth. Electrical current in amperes, um, temperature in Kelvin or degrees Celsius. There can be more than one um, standards, okay? Amount of substance is mole and light intensity in candela, okay? And the definitions for these units The definitions for these units follow, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I just welcome you to go through these definitions. Okay, if you want to understand the standard definition of meter, it is defined in terms of fundamental quantities. The speed of light, well, speed of light is a, um, 
is a universal constant. So that is used to define meter, so on and so forth. Kilogram. Second, all of these fundamental units and fundamental quantities are defined. Um, and then there's also prototypes. So there are definitions for temperature, um, there's definitions for mole, candela, so on and so forth. And then of course there are prototypes, okay? At the International Bureau of Weights and Measurements, okay? There are prototypes that um, um, codify and represent the um, length here, okay? So for example, meter is shown um, on the standard over here, and there are some um, there are some uh, different shapes of the the standard prototype is shaped the way it is, just so uh, the meter does not um, vary over time, just to ensure that this does not um, accidentally or over time um, deform in such a manner as to vary in length. Okay, to ensure its stability. There are a lot of structural um, elements to this standard. And there, all of these standards are held in the um, National Institute of Standards and Technology, NEST. Okay, but then um, it's just an understanding. Um, there, are, there are some derived units. So we looked at fundamental units so far, length, mass, um, current, um, luminous intensity, so on and so forth. Um, time from the derived from the fundamental units, there can be derived units. Okay, one over time number of cycles per second is called as frequency and it is expressed in one over second. Force is expressed in Newton, it is derived from kg's meters per second square. Okay, energy or work done expressed in joules. So the idea is based of these fundamental units okay ampere second coulomb okay um, volt uh, all of these weber all of these fundamental units can be combined to um, to understand more derived units okay there can be electrical charge okay electric potential electric resistance conductance um, capacitance, flux, inductance, so on and so forth. These are all derived units based of the fundamental units. Okay, there are definitions for these as well. I don't expect that you know all of these definitions, but what I do expect is that you should be able to um, refer to these um, table 1.2, and some of these are important. Some of these um, ohms, for example, Coulomb, capacitance, conductance, um, so on and so forth. All of these, some of these, owing to the fact that we use them over and over again in our class, uh, they become second nature to us, okay? If you, if you don't know them already, um, you should be able to at least look them up, okay? So well, that's the expectation. Now, you should be able to convert between different um, units, um, and it's kind of trivial, um, let's say um, elementary mathematics, okay, high school, high school math. It's um, it's useful to include SI units in your equations. We treat um, the SI units as an algebraic quantity, which can modify other values. So, for example, if you want to see how many meters in a mile, okay, well, you go off of the um, knowledge that one meter is thirty-nine point. 370 inches, okay, and one mile is 52.80 feet, and one foot is one foot is 12 inches. So what I have done is, in an effort to express um, number of meters per mile, I'm going to make use of a um, bunch of different conversions knowledge here. Um, there's 50 to 80 feet per mile. So one mile has 5,280 feet. And then um, one foot has 12 inches, so 12 inches per foot. And then um, 39.370 inches in one meter. 
So once I do that, um, it's trivial to see um, that feet cancel out, inches cancel here. We are left with, um, and when once we do the math, plug in the numbers into the calculator and do the math, we see that it is um, 1,609 meters per mile. So the important thing that we want to understand is we should be able to convert between different units and express it in um, SI units eventually. Okay, so that's that's a simple example. Okay, you'll frequently see numbers expressed in so-called scientific notation. Okay, in engineering, we use the really large numbers and really small numbers and everything in between. Okay, the range of numbers that we use in engineering um, applications is very, very wide and we have to have a, an efficient way of understanding. It doesn't make sense and it's not even intuitive to look at a number or something like this, okay? It doesn't um, give us intuition readily as a, so we have to have a different notion, a more shorthand intuitive notion of looking at really big or really small numbers. We often use the power of 10. Okay, and then um, as you know, there are these different powers of um, 10. Okay, we use micro quite often, nano reasonably often, pico um, sometimes. Okay, milli, yes, um, centimeter, decimeter. Some of these are less frequently used. Kilo, mega, giga. Okay, so if you're a, if you're in the um, financial field, you're talking about thousands, millions, billions, and of course, um, if you talk about the stimulus bill or some things of uh, certain things of that scale, you're talking about trillions. Okay, so ten to the twelve. Well, terra, we engineers like to call it in terms of terra, giga, mega, kilo, so on and so forth. Okay, and then of course there are certain nano, pico, um, other, other uh, micro um, notations that we should be aware of. Okay. So there is this uh, gentle lady, Grace Hopper. Um, who who um, who was associated with um, U.S. Navy, and in our and she was associated with um, associated with U.S. Navy, and she um, she was um, she brought to one conference a piece of wire around one foot of wire to show um, uh, the speed of light, okay? So um, in one nanosecond, in 10 to the negative second, this is how far, one feet at 11.8 inches is how far um, light travels. And in order to demonstrate that it's a really, really humongous um, number, huge number, Grace Hopper um, distributed uh, these uh, nano, nano, um, uh, what she called long pieces of wire um, that she called nanoseconds. Okay, so the idea is that um, it's the the length of the wire is the distance that light would travel in one nanosecond in order to drive home that point. Uh, and this is, and by the way, this is from uh, Dr. Uh, this is from Professor Tetro's uh, attendance at a conference. Okay, so that's about, why don't we stop? Questions, please, questions. I, I, I know we have a few more minutes left, but I do uh, want to stop here for today. Um, and then from the next class, maybe we we'll, uh, go from eight to 9.35. Questions, please. Questions so far? So starting tomorrow, 
will we continue with chapter 1.4 or are we jumping into chapter 2? We will um, start with chapter 1.4. Okay, so if we don't finish the entire lecture in a day, it's not like we're expected to read ahead and catch up or anything. We're going to continue in class. That is correct. And then I, that's correct. So my, my um, philosophy is that I want to spend enough time on all the sections and then give you opportunity to work on that at home. All right. Perfect. Thank okay. you. That's my only question. Yeah. yeah. All right. Other questions, please. All right. Thank you. So um, um, I do encourage you to um, be, um, be willing to ask questions. And I, I do make mistakes uh, from time to time. I, I forget units here and there. I, I you know, omit a decimal point. I don't know. Um, so be on the be on the lookout and don't be afraid to afraid to point that out to me. Sometimes um, I, I do silly things, like I start talking, assuming that the screen is already shared. But uh, um, on a couple of occasions, I found myself. Um, I found that I forgot to share the screen. So um, students typically uh, don't, uh, they kind of uh, hesitate to do that. Well, with me, you don't have to hesitate. You can feel free to, feel free to, uh, uh, you know, speak up anything that you want to speak up. Okay, now um, we're going to come back. These are all very, very simple topics. Just 1.4, 5, and 6 is what we have left, voltage current, um, ideal circuit element, basic circuit element, and then of course, uh, passive sign convention, power and energy. We'll come back to talk about these quick topics and move on from here. All right, so I'll see you folks tomorrow. Perfect, thank you, sir, have a good day. Take care.